Welcome to Delta, the podcast that dives into the heart of healthcare innovation. Each episode, we bring you insightful conversations with people who are at the forefront of the industry, researchers, policymakers, and startup founders. Join us as we explore the challenges, triumphs, and breakthroughs that are driving a significant change for a Delta in the healthcare system. Today's episode is brought to you by Supportful. Are you looking to grow your team and hire engineers? Look no further. Supportful is a company specializing in connecting you with the right people with the right skills. Whether you are building a web application or a mobile app, Supportful can help. They specialize in offering high-quality remote talent and have established successful partnerships with companies in the US, Europe, and Singapore. Additionally, Supportful addresses the brain drain in Lebanon, aiming to retain young, skilled professionals in the country by promoting remote work opportunities. And now, let's talk about today's guest. Today, we have the distinct honor of hosting Dr. Karim Hanna, a family medicine physician whose passion goes beyond clinical practice into integrating AI in the healthcare and medical education. He is the program director at the University of South Florida's Tampa's General Hospital Family Medicine Residency Program. His expertise doesn't stop there. He's also certified in clinical informatics helping to close the gap between artificial intelligence and medical education through his thought-provoking newsletter, AI in MedEd. Stay tuned as we talk about his journey, insights, and impactful work of Dr. Karim Hanna in today's episode. Welcome. Uh, Thank you so much for being here today with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. So can you share with me your journey toward becoming a family medicine physician you went through a lot you have a background in medicine you have a background in uh, clinical informatics how did you end up to become the program director of the usf Trumpa general hospital family medicine program so it's a great question there's a it's a very long story i'll try to give you the abridged version when i started medical school i was pretty sad on being a general surgeon and, and doing a surgical oncology fellowship afterwards uh when I experienced the family medicine, it really changed my trajectory dramatically. Um, and that's that's what stuck. Family mm-hmm. medicine kind of gave me the opportunity to do a whole lot of things and really be a generalist. And that's what I enjoy. I, I kind of enjoy seeing everything, doing a little bit of many, many different things. Now, going through residency, I, I still wasn't really sure where I would wind up. Was I going to be a hospitalist or, or do ER work? Or was I going to see kids or do OB or because you know, family medicine, you're trained with a whole lot of different skills during the residency training. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I found my way into academics because as a third year resident, I did uh, an elective teaching medical students. And I, I found it pretty fascinating. It really grabbed my attention. I really enjoy mentorship. And I think that was key uh, because I was mentored quite a bit and I wanted to some, you know, somehow pay it forward. Both of my parents were teachers or are teachers and they're both retired now. And I, I thought there's no way that I would wind up teaching. Um, but, you know, when you look back and you're like, wow, well, it kind of worked itself out that way. When I started my, my job here at USF in Tampa, um, I was, you know, assistant professor kind of beginning, didn't really know a whole lot about what teaching was and still trying to stand on your own feet, you know, clinically. Uh, and you're kind of doing both at the same time. They just throw you in. So after uh, two years, I went and did something called a faculty development fellowship, which is essentially a, a quick way of doing, uh, you know, learning how to be a teacher. And that was up at UNC. So I did that for a year and it was remote. So I, not remote, but I, w- I would go up for a couple of times and then a couple of weeks and then come back to Tampa, go up and come back to Tampa. And it it was a a fantastic experience, really shifted my career from being a clinician to being an educator uh, who happens to be a clinician as well. And that that was pivotal for me. And, you know, when you start kind of I got a role in a preclinical course. I was a co-course director for our pathophysiology uh, course in second year for students around cardio and poem and renal. So that was that was where I started the teaching, you know, big classroom, 180 students in the class kind of lecture didactic style things. And I found that I enjoyed really a whole lot of the kind of uh, smaller group teaching. And somehow I wound up ending up being the clinical uh, or a clerkship director for our family medicine or primary care clerkship. And I got really involved in some work and we published some work on 
transitioning from fourth year of medical school to residency internship and how that transition looks. How are we bridging that gap? Because a lot of program directors really say that there's a huge gap there that, that needs to be kind of squeezed. So, you know, we're not really, we weren't really preparing our students, I think, well for internship. And I think we're doing a better job now uh, over the past maybe five years or so. So one thing led to the other, led to the other. And uh, then our dean decided to start a second family medicine residency program. And, and you know, I applied for the role and, and was uh, given the opportunity to start it from scratch. And just actually last week, we got accreditation to be at Tampa General Hospital uh, for, for 24 residents starting in 2025. So not this cycle, but next cycle, we'll start accepting applications and, and going from there. So it's it's a long, long story. I tried to give you the kind of two minute version, but that's that's a bit of my journey uh, getting to where I'm at today. Yeah, congrats. I saw that post and I was like very excited. And I, I see your passion in your posts, you know, writing and your newsletter, which gonna talk about right now and i'm really happy uh for that as well like uh, i think when you have that funding to have more residents and to grow your program it's just like it becomes like one of your kids you want to see it grow yes <laughs> it's definitely become a project and you know i have two kids at home and watching them grow is hard it's not easy it's difficult i think it but i think hard things are important you need to do hard things i think that's one of the reasons why we're taking this on we want to impact our community here in tampa we want clinicians that are leaders. We want to build those clinicians. So that's you know a big big impetus for, for us taking this program on. Gotcha. You have a background in clinical informatics, and uh, how did this evolve? Like, how did you decide one day, okay, I'm going to go to clinical informatics and I'm going to use this in medicine? That's a great question. When I was you know growing up, I was always kind of the, the nerdy guy. Actually, in undergrad, I thought about majoring in computer science for a while. Um, and I had a kind of mm -hmm. a large, long history with loving mathematics. And that, that was kind of my, what I enjoyed most in school growing up. Mm -hmm. During, during uh, COVID, things slowed down quite a bit for all of us uh, clinically. And, and I, it kind of yeah, opened yeah. up opportunity for me to do some, uh, some work in data science. So I, I did like a year's worth of some coursework in, in data science. Uh, particularly around health informatics. Um, and I, I, I had a grant with, with some, some uh, colleagues at Moffitt Cancer Center here looking at the impacts of COVID on cancer screening. And uh, I used that grant or some of the funding uh, funded me to go kind of to a conference. So I got to go present at the conference. And it was at AMIA. Uh, I got to go to the American Medical Informatics uh, association conference. It was the first time I had seen this world. I wasn't really familiar with this world. Um, so it kind of was the data science experience plus this conference. And I was like, whoa, there's, there are people in, in tech doing healthcare. Uh, and I thought, well, that, that makes a lot of sense. Are these people running healthcare companies? No, they're not healthcare companies at all. Actually, they're running tech companies that happen to be in the health space. Um, and that really just grabbed my interest. And how, how can I be more involved in that space? So I, I actually was fortunate enough to be able to sit for the board exam because of my involvement in our local, in our health system, on our EHR, EHR kind of, uh, you know, committee and so on and so forth. I got, I've, I've had several involvements in, in research projects, kind of uh, doing things in clinical for informatics. So I was able to apply and sit for the board exam uh, without doing a two-year fellowship. So I think actually the, ne the next year is the last year that anyone can do that. Um, and then afterwards, you have to sit and do the two-year fellowship to be boarded in clinical informatics. So that's that's how I got into the space. It was kind of a an original just interest in tech, and then now you know I got boarded in, in CTI. Gotcha. So after next year, if people want to get like board certified in clinical informatics, they should do the fellowship. Like, do you have an idea what's the fellowship about? How the training is like? Yeah, it's it's a it's a two year program, usually limited clinically uh, to maybe one or two days a week of clinical work, and mm -hmm. it's not actually sub it's not specialty specific. So you can come out of surgery or peds or wherever you're coming from and, and apply to these programs, and uh, they're they're very much focused on different sorts of experiences, uh, some administrative work. They really prepare you to be in that CMIO or Chief Medical Informatics or the CIO 
chief informatics officer role. That's that's really what they're setting you up for. And I, I like to describe the that role as a, a translator between the, the finance folks, the the coding folks, the people who sit behind a computer screen all day, and then the clinicians. And you're kind of in the in the middle between those three. That's that's what that CMIO role is. And there have been people in this role who have just kind of wound up in this position without the training. So that's why they allowed for the the, the exam to be taken uh, for folks to be kind of grandfathered in during the, through that practice pathway. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. And um, talking about medical informatics and AI technology, um, I really like your newsletter and I read uh, your newsletter every time you send it and I see how you use AI um, in medicine, which is something I do a lot. So what prompted yeah. you to start this newsletter? Like, why did you start it? What grew your passion? Why one day you woke up and you said, okay, so let's start this newsletter. That's about AI and medicine. Yeah, so I'll say a couple of things to that. You know, being this far in your academic career, um, you really learn when to say yes to things. Because mm -hmm. when you say yes to something, you're saying no to a whole lot of other things. So I've tried to balance, and of course, it's hard wearing so many hats. It's hard to balance um, what you can do. Your bandwidth is, is limited, of course, only 24 hours in your day. Uh, but it was a, a good friend of mine. Her name's Sarah. Sarah's an anesthesiologist who started a, a group called Machine Learning for MDs or ML for MDs. And she's really keen on this space. And she was like, you know, Kareem, you, you have kind of two circles and I found, you know, I have I had kind of the clinical informatics world and the, the medical education world as my two interests. So she's like, why don't you try to see where those circles can overlap? So that's that's gotcha. kind of how I got, got into into that over that overlap. And that was the the beginnings of, well, there aren't really many people in this medical education space doing AI or talking about AI. And that was one of the the kind of starts uh, for the newsletter. And, you know, I found that it's, it's been a lot of fun, you know, writing my experiences. It's not, you know, rocket science. I'm just kind of writing what I've, go, I've gone through or read about and, and other people's opinions on things. And it's been a lot of fun writing those those newsletters. So thank you for reading. No, I agree. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun even reading it because like uh, it's I'm very interested in AI as well. And when I see like other clinicians who are trying to figure things out on how we can improve uh, how we practice medicine, right? You mentioned one of your letters, I think, in one of your uh, newsletters, like you practice medicine, so it's something's going to change. Uh, it's not something that is constant, and that's important. And it's just like I look at into AI as a calculator. Like if I ask you that, what is the square root of 3,567? You're not going to do that by hand. You're just going to use a calculator, and that's normal. But I think integrating AI as a calculator, especially in healthcare, met lots of resistance. And um, that brings me to the next topic. So I, I want to grab your mind, uh, since you have background in both spaces, um, how how AI and clinical informatics mix with medicine? How have these fields influenced the curriculum development in your residency program as a program director? Yeah, so because we're building from the ground up, we're very fortunate to kind of have a clean slate. We can really make a whole lot of things happen. So right now we have, we're, we're working towards building tracks for our residents. Uh, mm -hmm. They can do certificate programs, for example, in clinical informatics or in informatics, health informatics, or in public health, or, you know, even if they want to get an MBA, for example. And those certificates they'll work on during the three years. And then if they want to stick around as a fourth year uh, resident and kind of junior faculty role, uh, because most family residencies are three years, some are four. Uh, but we'll offer them the opportunity to stick around and finish their full master's degree and, uh, you know, do some some junior faculty things, teaching and so on and so forth, supervising in clinic. So we're, we're, we're building it in. The other way we're building in informatics into our, our, our curriculum is, is, you know, family medicine, our, our residencies are very outpatient heavy. So our, our residents are going to have panels and be responsible for essentially a population of patients uh, during the three years and have continuity with that patient panel throughout the three years. So we'll be able to look at their population's health, you know, looking at the, wow. the, the, data, the data from the EHR, how they're doing as clinicians. They'll be able to assess their work, 
you know, uh, pre, uh, let's say, Kareem coming into residency, how this panel was doing and how they're doing a year in, two years in, three years into my care with them. You know, am I improving their, for example, their A1C outcomes? How am I doing on cancer screenings? How am I doing, you know, uh, you know, whichever way you want to you want to look at the data. Um, and, and that's going to take, well, a lot of work because that's infrastructure that's not currently present in many health systems. Um, so we're, we have a, a head of uh, a research lead in our department that we recently hired who's going to be working towards maybe getting us some grant funding so we can seek out those opportunities in, in, in more depth. But it's going to be special. It's going to be really, uh, you know, something that we prioritize that informatics world. And uh, you know, so something that's going to be, uh, uh, I think, special to our residency program. Wow, that's that, that's very creative. Like, I, I really um, like this, uh, that you already realize how important is this part of medicine, which is like AI in medicine, and you are trying to integrate that. And uh, I think the continuity of care is also very important, something I didn't like understand during residency, like I trained in internal medicine. So um, yeah. we don't have that continuity clinic, but like uh, when, when I started doing oncology, uh, I think continuity of care is important, not only for patients, but for you as a physician being trained, you, you see the pathology and how it evolves over time. And you build like, you, you, you know, your patient, right? Like you, you can never, 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 ever know everything about your patient the first time you meet them. The first time you meet them, you know their illness. The second time you meet them, you know what they do for life. The third time you meet them, you understand how difficult the social situation they live in is, right? Oh, yeah. So it, it's, 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 it's something that comes with, uh, with time. So I think that's, that's really, really uh, interesting. And that's really good uh, for residents um, and having that access to AI. Um, staying, talking about residents, how, how do you integrate AI beyond clinical informatics when you are teaching residents and you are teaching medical students, how would you integrate AI in your teaching? Yeah, I think there are maybe three or four different kind of categories that we can group uses in. So mm -hmm. I think first there's like the clinical decision support category, mm -hmm. which is done prior to the teaching encounter. But for example, if we're in the hospital and a patient is admitted uh, who's septic, and the, the, the EHR reminds us that patient is septic, you should start your sepsis protocol. Uh, that sort of, uh, that is AI working on, on our team essentially to cue us to a certain pathology that maybe we weren't aware of. So there's clinical teaching that, that can take place because of uh, you know, clinical decision support. In the, in the classroom, like if you think books, preclinically, um, chat GPT in particular, if we're talking about large language models that are publicly available, we, we utilize chat GPT to do a whole lot of things to make for safe environments. I think simulation is a great place uh, where chat GPT can fit in very well for those preclinical students to work on developing their history taking skills and which exam findings are significant for which sort of case. Um, and because it's so low risk, I mean, they can do it and practice it on their own time and time again. You can also utilize it to create questions. They can utilize it to review their, their PowerPoint slides. So many ways that it can be used in the preclinical. In the clinical setting, too, when you have medical students with you, uh, I've utilized ChatGPT to help them further develop their thinking. So ChatGPT is not the best always at cl giving clear-cut guidelines. Uh, but they can utilize it to help develop their differential diagnosis, for example. And now with kind of the latest GPT-4, students can, can use pictures, can upload PDFs, can do a whole lot of different things to, to be able to utilize it as a, a sidekick. I think, I think like you, you mentioned calculator earlier, like it's a sidekick. It should assist us in our day-to-day. -day. It should assist us in our teaching, administrative tasks, clinical decision-making. Uh, that's how we can utilize it to its full full capacity. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Like even for me, like I'm I'm in fellowship and uh, I use ChatGPT heavily. Not only ChatGPT, like Bard, Binge, Cloud. Um, for example, like I, I just uh, like I had a 
uh, some tests that I didn't know how to interpret. So I just like throw it in the chat GPT and it, it broke it down into like, you have to look into this, you have to look into this, you have to look into this, and that's the interpretation. And it was really good. And uh, other than oh, yeah. that, administrative things, like we create lots of PowerPoint slides and presentations in academia. I just take a text, put in chat GPT, tell chat GPT, create a slide with bullet points. Boom, it's there. And instead of wasting my time clicking enter, 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 bullet point, enter, bullet points, right? Um, yeah. So I think the users are enormous. It's the, the, the list doesn't end. The list doesn't end. I, re I really like what you're doing with it. Um, and I think it, it just makes so much sense for folks to get on board. And then, you know, people worry about it taking over. Uh, and I usually try to use the analogy of a, of a printer. You know, people were using pen and paper. And then mm -hmm. we had printers come up at some point or, or, or you know, typewriters, for example, and then printers. Um, you don't lose the, I'm sure people were like, oh no, we're never gonna use pen and paper again. You still utilize pen and paper just in different ways. They, the, 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 use, the use has changed. So as clinicians, you know, it's not like we're gonna lose radiologists, for example. That's been one of the you know frequent talks about uh, you know ChatGPT and uh, OpenAI or, or large language models uh, interpreting image results or mm -hmm. interpreting slides. You know, for pathologists, um, I think you're just gonna have to. They're gonna have to pivot. the The field of radiology is gonna have to shift a little bit to uh, uh, utilize it and accommodate uh, how they can uh, best use it for patient care. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about physicians who are already in train, like in practice, like you are in practice? Um, how do you think that, or can you give me examples about how do you use ChatGPT on a day to day basis when you practice in the clinic? So, clinicians are a very difficult group of people to change their habits, particularly if they've been in practice for a long time. And you and I, before we started recording, we're talking about how, you know, healthcare is a big ship and it's very slow moving in general. Um, changing things are, are it's difficult to, to influence change. Uh, in my clinical practice, I would say I, I've utilized it for simple things, administrative tasks like creating letters for patients or, you know, to consultants if I need to write a letter for someone missing work or some, some scenario that needs a letter. Um, I've used it for interpreting results like you have uh, recently, most recently, I had a PFT done for a patient, pulmonary function test for a patient, yeah. and it hadn't yet, it hadn't yet been read. So the, the, the results were there from the tech, but I didn't have a formal read from a pulmonologist, right, or someone signing off on the read. And, you know, we know a little bit as primary care docs, we know a little bit about many things. So I, I can kind of, I, I get the gist of it from looking at it, but I took the PFTs which are a bunch of numbers for those listening who don't know what those are. It's just a bunch of numbers with, with acronyms. So FVC, you know, FEV1 over FVC, all these, these acronyms. And I copied and pasted, threw it in the chat GPT, asked for interpretation. It was fantastic. It confirmed for me that this was not an obstructive process, told me the patient doesn't have COPD or asthma, the patient was good to go, so on and so forth. So it was, it was really nice to utilize to expedite things, even if it's not a formal, you know, clinician reading it, if we know just enough uh, we can we can utilize it again as a sidekick, um, and then you know you can you can use it uh, to to again administratively to respond to patient tasks. Uh, you know there are lots of AI companies now looking at just sorting out your inbox, uh, what is most important to to least important, and then just doing that sifting through so you don't have a hundred tasks when you open up your tasks. So, lots of ways. Yeah, I can't agree more. I think when it comes to tasks, like it's uh, even like I'm not in practice yet, but like I, I think administrative things comes with medicine. When you are a medical student, your email inbox is full every single day. You have to clean it and then things get worse with residency. Things get worse once you become a staff. You are um, uh, like uh, taking care of patients uh, because like you get lots of results, emails. And so I think... Oh, finding a way of AI with some human um, interaction can help uh, to decrease that administrative burden and uh, filtering the noise out of the important stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, so one of the things that I do worry about, and I think lots of clinicians uh, worry about, it's like the, the ethical part and the HIPAA compliance 
and uh, SOC 2 compliance and the information, like uh, what do you think like are the ethical uh, consideration? Like, let's say I'm a physician, I'm listening to this. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and use AI. Um, like, what are the ethical rules or what are the things I should pay attention to so I don't get in trouble? Yeah, so it's it's not perfect. And I'm glad you bring this up because we always need to know that the coin has two sides, right? So we know, for example, um, when we're using social media platforms, the data that we are clicking on, the, the, the data that they are pulling from us is being sold to advertisers and so on and oh, so yeah. forth. So that, the, so, you know, we are the, the the product, actually. We're the ones being sold. Uh, our, our use is, is, is mm -hmm. being uh, traded for some sort of funds. So the, the concern there can be on different levels, but is it appropriate for me to utilize, first of all, a, a sidekick uh, in, in helping make clinical decision making? And I, I usually respond to this by saying, hey, well, you know, you, you've used up to date, you know, you've used these resources, you've opened the textbook. Uh, it wasn't in your brain. Does that mean uh, you are, you know, uh, mis- uh, not communicating the 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 truth that is what you know to your patients you know are you are you leaving something out when talking to your patients i think it's as long as we are utilizing it appropriately uh we can we can use it in our clinical decision making now what about you know the ethics of like uh the bias that might be uh, within these systems because these systems are only as good as the the data that was trained they were trained on so we need to be aware of these biases or the, the 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 possibility of the potential or the potential for the bias so that when we're using it we can kind of curtail or kind of um adjust now you mentioned also hipaa compliance i know right now uh open ai or, or or chat gpt is not hipaa compliant i believe that bing is and i think within our hospital system they actually block the use of of chat gpt with on our networks like our internal wow. networks uh yeah it's kind of painful i we can talk about that too but with the intent of let's use a microsoft derivative through bing uh that will allow for you know they bing also uses chat gpt on the on the back end but will allow for a um data sensitive kind of safe uh, HIPAA compliant way in case physicians or clinicians are utilizing it for with patient data. But, you know, if you're using it on your own, for example, I, you know, I use it on my phone. If a patient texts me or something, I use it on my phone very, very frequently. Um, and I can leave out the patient sensitive or the patient identifying information. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what we've done for years. If you're, you know, doing anything uh, online with, with patient information. So, uh, it just takes, I think, a responsible user is a big part of it. You know, the, the, today, the, actually, the, the White House, I don't know if you saw, put out their recommendations for, you know, their, the beginnings of some rules for, for mm -hmm. ethical AI mm -hmm. use. And I think that's going to be the beginning of a whole lot of conversations. There will be committees, there will be uh, meetings, uh, all surrounding this concept, because it's so powerful, uh, and there's so much potential that there have to be the bumpers on the on the bowling alley and uh, the bowling lane sorry you have to keep the bumpers up so that people don't go out of control one way or the other and kind of can head in the appropriate direction well yeah i, I completely agree um it's uh it, it can be sometimes dangerous tools because like it helps you to link information together and brainstorm crazy ideas uh i think the thinker is still a human being the person who put things together like i think we have ability to think but ChatGPT have ability to help us brainstorm better, uh, write things better, and it's it's there. Like it's why why we don't use it. So for example, like by leaving patients' information from outside of the notes. Uh, let's say I dictated the note without mentioning any patient um, related information, but the note really like have like it sucks. There is no time yeah. frame. It's all over the place. And instead of me sitting an hour spending it on this note, I can just help ask ChatGPT to organize this note in a better way, and then I can go and take care of another patient. Um, yeah. So those sorts of ambient scribes are going to change the game for us. Um, and I, I should have mentioned that earlier when we were talking about physicians. Yeah. What do you think about them? I, I, I'm I'm really looking forward to hear your thoughts about ambient scribes. We we I've tested out a couple of them actually, and and 
they're fantastic. I mean, they, they, they definitely offload. I don't think they're perfect. I think they're really useful for folks who do a lot of note writing. I think in my practice, because I know, I want to say I know 95% of my patients really well, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. or pretty well. So I'm able to kind of, um, my my notes are very simple. I'm not writing a whole lot of new notes. I'm carrying forward things and, and mm -hmm. it's already at a minimum. I use a lot of templated things. Um, so my note writing, my burden of kind of documentation is not as high as some other clinicians, I think. Folks who see a lot of new patients, I don't know, like think orthopedic surgery, for example, there's mm -hmm. a lot of turnover in their clinic. Those, those, those docs are going to save a lot of time uh, by using these like, you know, uh, these scribes, these ambient scribes are going to do so much. And it's, it's, it's wonderful because they're not just scribing now. You know, I was recently at a conference and I got to test out a whole lot of things with different companies. They're not just scribing. They're pulling in your, your social history from other notes and implementing it. And they're, they're doing medication reconciliation. They're prescribing, they're ordering labs for you automatically while you're just having the discussion on diabetes. It's prepping the A1C uh, you know, pending for you. You know what I'm saying? Then wow. they're, you know, yeah, they're they're billing and coding are automatically. So all of these things are already taking place. Um, and and it's 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 so far ahead that it's hard to grapple with. Like it's hard to imagine. Like, wow, we we don't need people doing double checking our billing. We don't need people doing this, that, and the other, and making sure that the codes are appropriate and making sure you know. How are we going to set ourselves up so we don't need the prior auth later? You know, like so that the you know we're not we're not getting the the peer to peer phone call later. The note is already adjusting for that, knowing that it's going to be needed. If I'm ordering, for example, some DME equipment for for my 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 patient, it's just fascinating what's what's coming down the pipeline. No, I completely agree. Which which conference was this? This was the family medicine uh, experience. It's called FMX. It's the double AFPs, one of the bigger family medicine conferences. And it was at Chicago. And this was just kind of in the display, uh, you know, all, all the different companies kind of having their, their little uh, showcase uh, of what they're doing. And uh, there were more than a handful. There were probably 10 or 15 different AI uh, documentation sort, sort of companies uh, doing amazing work. I mean, it was impressive to see uh, what they're doing. One of the companies, um, and you know, I, I I don't necessarily work for any of these folks, so I, I don't want to throw out yeah, their names. Yeah, we can mention their name, yeah. Yeah. Well, some people are are are, are pre-visit prepping the note by having AI have the conversation with the patient as if it was the clinician. Oh my God! And this is they, so sweet. Yeah. So it's like it's like. A reverse classroom. You've heard of the concept of reverse classroom, where I give you like an article to read, and then you come and we just discuss the article. Yes, right? yeah, so, exactly. So yeah. So so they they have the conversation with the AI bot. It gets their medical history, all the meds, the social history. Uh, it's asking the HPI with all the ins and outs, right? Uh, mm -hmm, and creating mm -hmm. a a living document so that when they show up to clinic, the document is done. Already there. You just read it. You can Already read it there. the day before. And you're verifying and you're making sure that everything is, you know, appropriate as the clinician. The coding is done, the billing is done. Uh it's just it's it really offloads the administrative tasks. It's it's fantastic. Yeah, I can't agree more. Uh, like that's I, I, I'm active also in the startup world and I've I've seen this like a lot. It's it's, it's something that needs to be sold. I used also like amb uh, ambient scribes. Um, some of them are good. So I, I think they are better used in the outpatient setting uh, mm -hmm. because like, once you're in the hospital, you are rounding, you're going from one room to another. It becomes a burden to carry on a laptop or carry on a uh, iPad. I used to play it on my, like run the browser on my iPad. What it yeah. would work is like if they can create so the ones that I use, they don't have an app. So if there's an app you can download on your phone and you can use this. Yeah. Yeah. So the one I use, yeah, I use Dax. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that's a nuanced company. And and that that one was on my phone and it was super easy to just hit record and go for it. You know, and I think that at the time they they had some other people editing the notes on the back end too. So it, it was AI plus a human, then it comes to me. 
Wow, so that's, it was, that's amazing. Yeah, it was pretty good. It was pretty good quality. Um, the, the the notes were pretty good when I was we we did a trial run with it. Yeah, I, I should give it um, a try. It's called Dex, right? D A X, yeah, Dex. D A X, yeah. And that brings me to the second point, or like third, third or fourth by now. Uh, adoption by healthcare. I, I want to pick your brain. It's like I, I think there are tons of technologies. Uh, that are very useful for physicians and for hospitals, but lots of there will be some challenges by hospitals and phys first physician. You mentioned that it's very hard to change their practices and hospitals because like there is no money made in like buying a more expensive dictation software when you have physicians doing the work for you and like you are paying them the same. It's just an extra yeah. expense. So, so let's take a break it down. What advice do you have for physicians on adopting these technologies? Well, the first thing I would say is they need to try. Mm -hmm. Try, and then, and then they can decide if they want to utilize it or not. But the idea is that it is supposed to make your life easier. So if it's, if it's going to make your life more difficult, then don't use it. That's okay. It's, it's not the end all. But I will say um, clinicians at some point, uh, we'll have to get on the bandwagon. It's just like what happened with the, the High Tech Act when they started the EHR mandates, right? Mm -hmm. People were, mm -hmm. when I was an intern, I, I had handwritten notes. In the beginning of my residency, we had oh handwritten notes. Yeah, it was wild. It was wild. I, you know, I don't, I don't remember how I did it, but I imagine writing 11, 13 notes. You know, they weren't great and the handwriting wasn't great, but still just the concept of 11, 13 notes every day in the chart um, was painful. So uh, when the EHR came, there were there's always like kind of your first adopters, the slower adopters, and then mm -hmm. everyone kind of mm -hmm. jumps on the bandwagon. Uh, and, you know, we know that curve. Uh, and your, your, your first adopters are probably already interested and we're, we're the ones that are interested in having these conversations now. And there will be a group of people who will be slow to kind of convince them, uh, them and they need to try it out first. And then there will people, be people who just never, never want to really do it. But at some point, it's going to become commonplace. Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree. I, I think physicians, like in general, like if it's working, don't um, fix it. But yeah. there from my experience like even like in like uh, i had some experience with young uh like residents who like if we implemented a new software to the program the, you, you will have always like two three types of people and there is a, like some segment in a population that no matter what you do they will not like it they will not adopt it there will always be problem in the software that you are using um right. so i think it's just like it is what it is um you, yeah. you, you can't change that it's, it's it's statistics yeah you're right yeah. And um, so you, you're in a leadership position. What do you think would, mot like, would, would motivate hospitals or programs or clinics to buy more expensive uh, software that helps physicians, although it doesn't bring more money? Well, I'm sure you've heard of the, the, the quadruple aim or the quintuple aim now from the IHI, where clinician wellness is key for patient outcomes to happen. You need good, good for mm. patient outcomes to improve. You need you need kind of physician wellness to be part of it. It's it's this like for for the health system, uh, it's imperative that clinicians are doing well. Uh, and if you're not familiar with it, I can I can share some stuff about it with you. Yeah, later, I would love to hear about it. Just the quadruple aim, or the the quintuple aim is the most recent version of it. Uh, or physician wellness is part of the the Institute of uh, on Health, like that's the, that's what they're recommending. So to keep physicians doing well, you need to decrease their burnout. Their administrative load is always tied to burnout. Uh, redundancy is tied to burnout. Uh, so those those sort of things, the hospital can help alleviate. And in so doing, the hospitals will see that hopefully improved physician wellness equals less physician turnover. Physicians are really expensive to recruit and very expensive when someone leaves a practice. The, the strain on the other practitioners that are still there is immense. So you want to retain your doctors. 
you want to retain your doctors. It's really important. So the hospital system should see the end value of physician wellness already. So this will just be part of that physician wellness package. Um, you know, the other thing is, if I am saving 20, 30 minutes, I know this is not the answer that physicians want to hear, um, but if I'm saving, you know, 10 minutes of documentation on every patient I see, that might allot me some more time to do more billable services, right? So, so you know, they talk about billable real estate in clinical settings. They talk about billable services on my time. Um, and that's one of the things that now I have more capacity to see maybe an additional patient. That additional patient across the board every day for every every clinician will easily cover the cost. Uh, one of the companies that I was talking with this weekend um, was discussing the the five x. You know, they they say you know if you pay x dollars, you'll you'll make five x by using our 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 software because of the time and burden that that's what they were estimating. No, I agree with that. That's a that's that's a great selling point. I've worked in, in many hospitals, and like the last thing you want to hear or you want to see physicians who just like want to finish and they want to move to somewhere else like they don't want, want to stay in that hospital and that hospital will have so much hard time in recruiting a new faculty and as you mentioned uh -huh. I, I never thought about this point but you from your point as a faculty and you know how hard it is i think that's a very good point of a very good way of thinking about it yeah i mean it's 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 very painful to have to you know hire and and it's turnover is a thing right like it's just a constant problem but we know that recruiting, uh, I know for specifically for family medicine, recruiting a family medicine physician is an expensive undertaking and it's it's it, it's painful for the system. So the health system knows these things. You just got to talk to the right people um, so that they, you know, want to keep the, their, their folks around by utilizing technology like this. Gotcha. Let's say um, a person who doesn't like technology and I want to start adapting to technology. I go and I subscribe to your newsletter what else i should uh, what else should i do like how can upcoming medical professionals physicians residents students be ready to thrive in the evolving landscape of healthcare because it is coming how can i how yeah. i can adapt to this technology yeah i you know there are lots of free educate there's lots of free education online i think uh youtube is a great place to start you know watching videos like this uh, it's a great place to start where we can learn about uh, what is out there and how I can utilize it. The other thing is, you know, it's time to roll up your sleeves and try something out. Um, create a, a, an account on ChatGPT and just ask it questions, clinical or not. See what it can do for you uh, so that you can uh, then learn to harness it. And, and you know, I talk about uh, being on the edge of comfort and safety and danger. So there's there's danger where like you don't want to be when you're practicing medicine. There's comfort where you also don't want to be because then you can miss something. And then there's some we're right in the middle that yellow space between the green and the red, right? That yellow space is where you want to be because that's that's how you're constantly learning. You're on your toes. You're you're trying to kind of take new things in. We have to be. If we're not if we're not growing, then we're stagnant and stagnant you know, we know muscles, they, they fall apart when, when you're just sitting in bed in the hospital for, for days, right? So, so we have exactly. to constantly be working to progress. Uh, and that's, that's on us. It's, I think it's our responsibility to be lifelong learners as physicians. Otherwise, we're going to miss things. And, and patient outcomes, you know, as an oncologist, you know, like the, the way we treat uh, metastatic disease now is very different than the way we treated it before. Uh, oh, yeah, you know, for we, sure. It's completely different. And depending on the cancer, the way we treat prostate cancer today is so different than we did 10 years ago. So so all of these things are changing. It's on us to stay up to date and, and stay on top of these recommendations. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think medicine and healthcare is like it's 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 a it's it's a journey. It's, it's a lifelong journey, it's a commitment. It's not something that you can um just like stop learning. So it's not only about learning medicine, it's also how to practice medicine. So the tools that you use are different and the tools that you use are not something taught in medical school. It's something that you have to learn by using in real life and real practice. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, med school is a, um, it's the beginner's guide. You know, oh, it's yeah. just the base basics. Uh, 
practice is so different. Residency is so different. Uh, real life is 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 very different than than medical school. I agree. I agree. Anyways, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for all the advice um, you shared uh, today. And uh, I really encourage everyone who's listening to us to sign up to your letter. I love your letter. I, I love the advice that you offer. And also all the links to your page, your newsletter will be mentioned below. Thanks, Ruben. I appreciate talking with you. It was a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully we'll do this again. Of course.